Support for this program is provided by the men and women of the Louisiana Forestry Association. Through sustainable forestry, LFA members promote the health and productivity of Louisiana's forests for generations to come. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. Hello and welcome to Louisiana Public Square. I'm Beth Courtney. And I'm Kirby Goodell, Director of LSU's Public Policy Research Lab. Last month, as many of us in Louisiana sat down to give thanks for all we have, many of our fellow citizens went without. A sluggish national economy has translated into high unemployment and increases in the number of friends and neighbors who need a helping hand. When those individuals reached out, assistance was there from one of the more than 20,000 nonprofit organizations in Louisiana. Well, Louisiana nonprofits also enrich our lives through cultural activities, health services, and after school programs. If you've attended a symphony, worked out at the local Y, or even enjoyed a box of thin mints, your life has been touched by a nonprofit. Tonight, we explore the challenges that Louisiana nonprofit organizations face from the current economy and what that means for the people they serve. As we celebrate this season of giving, we take time to ask, what needs to be done to help the state's nonprofits give back? You see a tiny little propeller. They are known as the greatest generation for their contribution to our country. When it comes to philanthropy, their generosity is also unparalleled. Ross Gamble is a veteran of World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, who volunteers his time at the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. I volunteer because my country has been very good to me, very good to me. And I've been very fortunate in being a part of this. And now it's my opportunity to give back a little something that, for what I've received. Gamble contributes not only his mornings, but also his money to the facility. Giving financially says, I support it. That puts uh, an exclamation point on supporting it. Through the support of veterans in Louisiana and others around the country, the museum has already raised more than half of the $300 million needed to cover its planned expansion. Four new pavilions will portray all campaigns of the war and each branch of the military. Museum President Dr. Gordon Mueller. Uh, these guys uh, came home and gals who served uh, feeling very fortunate to live in the greatest and freest and richest country in the world. And they've been generous um, in uh, giving back to the country they love. A study by EDGE Research bears this out. The next generation of American giving notes that 79% of those born in 1945 or earlier give to charity. 67% of boomers donate, followed by 58% of Generation Xers. At the youngest end of the spectrum are those members of Generation Y, born between 1981 and 1991. An estimated 56 percent of this generation donates to charity. Our nation's greatest renewable energy source is the idealism of young people. Yeah. Jennifer Epplett Riley is the co-founder of City Year, a nonprofit organization that uses the talents of 17 to 24-year-olds in public schools. While members of Gen Y may not have the funds to contribute, Riley says they volunteer their time, a movement she attributes to Hurricane Katrina. It really was a defining moment for that generation. They just saw that what was happening in their own country and said, you know, we want to serve, we want to help. City Year members commit to mentoring and tutoring students for a full year. Ashley Kovach, a City Year member from California, is giving her time, rather than money, to students at Magnolia Woods Elementary in Baton Rouge. I think a lot of the City Year members, most of them, even if they did have that disposable income, they would be here, um, including myself, because like I said, it's, it's really, it's apparent that we need to start with these kids. And that's where it starts. Both time and money will be needed to assist nonprofits in Louisiana as they face current economic challenges. Nonprofit organizations across the state are re reporting reductions in income resulting from the economic downturn. The, this is result, uh, reduction in income from grants, 
uh, from sponsorships and individual donations. Kelly Chavez Green is with the Louisiana Association of Nonprofit Organizations, or LANO. The 2009 LANO survey of its members revealed an 11.5 percent drop in funding from 2008, but an uptick in need. 80% of respondents reported an increase in need and demand for services resulting from the economic downturn. This happens in a recession. Families um, tend to be in more need, perhaps with uh, emergency food or assistance with uh, housing and meeting their bills. The Deepwater Horizon oil spill in South Louisiana further exacerbated the demand for services. Respondents to Lano's survey reported the greatest decrease in funding was from state government, followed by individual donations. In 2008, Governor Jindal established new criteria for funding of non-governmental organizations, or NGOs. At the end of that year's legislative session, he vetoed 358 of 370 NGO line items. With the state facing $1.6 billion budget shortfall, this year NGO funding may come under even further scrutiny. A lot of the, you know, the health care services are provided through nonprofit organizations, and cuts in uh, state spending impact the ability of nonprofits to provide these services to Louisiana families. Edward Ashworth is with the nonprofit Louisiana Budget Project. He recently joined with 20 other nonprofits to form better choices for a better Louisiana. Rather than focusing on NGO funding, Ashworth feels more attention should be paid to the 441 tax exemptions that are in the state's budget. Currently, Louisiana is spending approximately $7.1 billion a year on these tax exemptions. Some of them are very valuable and serve a needed purpose. Others, while maybe needed at the time they were enacted, are no longer needed and we want those to be reviewed. In the meantime, nonprofits are meeting their economic challenges through earned income, shared services, and collaboration with other nonprofits. I talked to folks at the food bank, and they have a real problem getting fresh produce to their food pantry sites, and uh, one of those being Hope Ministries. Barry Meyer is the executive director of the ARC of Baton Rouge. The ARC serves children and adults with developmental disabilities. The organization recently began a collaboration with the Baton Rouge Food Bank and Hope Ministries, which serves the working poor. Using Hope Ministries' property, adult clients of the ARC will grow vegetables. Ten percent of the produce will be donated to Hope's food pantry, which is stocked by the food bank. The remaining vegetables will be sold to pay the workers, many of whom are becoming employed for the first time. It's one of those you know, one solution to many problems kinds of approaches. And that's what a collaborative effort really comes down to, is how can we uh, incorporate something into what we do where it's, it resolves a lot of uh, problems that other organizations might have uh, that they're trying to resolve as well. So it is a win-win-win in this particular situation since it's three agencies collaborating together. Despite the challenges that Louisiana nonprofits face, these organizations may find comfort in a recent survey by the Red Cross. The report found that despite their personal economic conditions, nearly three out of four people plan on giving the same amount or more to charities this holiday season. Joining me in the studio to share their plans for charitable giving are our audience members. They include Baton Rouge area residents who were randomly recruited and surveyed for us by LSU's Public Policy Research Lab. We also have three members of City Year Louisiana, whose motto is, give a year, change the world. Reviewing some of the survey questions, when asked their plans for charitable giving this year, 53% of our respondents said they will give more than last year, while 34% will give the same amount. An equal number, 7% either plan to give less or have not decided what they will give. Ask their thoughts on whether tax write-offs are the best way to motivate people to give, a total of 71% agreed or strongly agreed. A total of 22% disagreed, some strongly, and 8% were neutral. When those we survey do give, 51% of them feel more comfortable giving to an individual in need rather than an organization that provides goods and services. 43% prefer giving to an organization, and 7% are unsure. It's the season of giving, but we are also in the midst of a difficult and prolonged economic recession. So how is this affecting your ability to give? 
Are you able to give as much this year as in the past? Jack, would you, how is uh, this affecting your ability to give? Well, we're going to give as much as we have in the past. It's, uh, for us, it's a blessing to give, and uh, we may have to cut back on a few items, but we feel that giving is the right thing to do. And, and, and Carlos, are, are you seeing more need out in the community this year than in, than in past years? Yes. I work closely with Hope Ministries and some of the other projects we have going in the city, and I do see much more need. What about uh, Janet? Are, are you seeing more need this year than in, in past years, or is it going to affect your giving? My giving should be part of my budgetary plan, and, and is, and so whether it is a great need and there's more people who need or whatever I'm going to do my charitable donation as I can okay. and and Ronnie giving is how important is it to you personally to give back to your community and to give to charities and uh, nonprofit organizations well it's extremely important for me to give back because it's uh, it, it's it's part of my uh, uh, my upbringing I, I'm uh, I'm a, uh, a Christian and in uh, charity is a Christian deed, okay. and it, 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 it presents uh, or it shows that uh, I have worth and value when I make an effort to give and to encourage others to give. Jesse, you're shaking your head. Or is that do you do you I, agree? Yes, sir. I couldn't agree more. My parents taught me to always help those less fortunate, and as a student. Mm -hmm. Um, although I can't donate a lot of money, I am sure I will donate my time. Okay. And speaking of time, uh, how we have two members of, of City Year Louisiana. Talk to us about giving your time and giving a year to this community. Uh, Sarah? Like uh, she was saying, I don't really have the means money-wise, but I can definitely put myself out there and put in a lot of time and through City Year, not only are we able to give in the schools, but we're also able to give back to the community, whether that's through like building a house or volunteering at a food bank. Now, now, how do you decide? How did you decide to to join uh, City Year Cortez? How did you decide to join City Year? What 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 brought you to this particular organization? Well, what brought me to City Year was I saw a need in the public school system for just to give that kind of assistance and. I came from that school system because I am a native of Louisiana, so I just wanted to give back because I'm a product of that same school system. Okay. And now when you, when you see a uh, nonprofit organization, Brad, for example, do you give because you believe this is, this is somewhere where you can have effect? You believe this is where you have need? What's the, what, what drives your interest in, in, in giving to different organizations? Oh, the, what I would be the best motivation to me is uh, where I see a definite need. If I see a lot of people giving to one organization when another one is in greater need and has less people uh, looking after it, then that is more motivation for me to give to that organization. Additionally, um, wherever there is, yeah, that's, that's basically it. If, if you have to balance sort of need versus effectiveness, what's most important to you? Is it, is it, is it because the organization appears to be having real impact, or is it because it's serving a, serving a community need? William, do you have? Um, I, I don't think that you can say it's one or the other. I think it's always both. I, I mean, certain, certain aspects speak to me personally, and so I'm going to um, tend towards giving to those um, principles, okay? Um, so things like food banks, I'm probably more likely to give to. I also, though, do look, I go a little bit smart with it, and I do look at what is the percent of money that I give to them that actually gets to the end product, to the user, you know? If, I, um, if they've got a... 50 or 75 percent overhead, that's a really high overhead. But if they've got like a 25 percent or lower overhead, going to administration costs or disseminating the funds to, to uh, actually get to the, uh, the charitable purpose, then I'm more likely to get to that. Do, do you feel like you know when you make that contribution that, it, that it's getting there? Uh, I research it. <laughs> um, okay. Not all the time, sure, though. Sure. Not all the time. Like, let's be honest, you know, the kid knocks on the door and, and asks uh, um, for a donation for their <laughs> soccer league or something. Okay, right. personal contact does mean something, so, you know, you, you give a little bit to that. Right. This is, this is the Christmas season, so are you all seeing more appeals, and, and are those appeals more gut-riching this year than, than, than maybe in past years because of the recession? Janet, you? Yes, there's a Santa Claus ringing a bell on every corner. 
and sometimes two or three of them. And James, what it, uh, when, obviously a need. Oh, I'm sorry, right. James. When you're when you're uh, when you're giving, uh, how important is is feeling like the money's being used and it's accountable? Uh, I agree with him. I, there there are several organizations that are just really too top heavy with uh, uh, administrative things. Uh, the CEOs making tons of money. It it, it uh, uh, I would stay away from those. Uh, I would prefer to give on a, on a individual type basis if I know somebody is in need that's trying hard, that's that's uh, trying to get out there and do do good and just on hard times, I'd rather something like that. Yeah. Carlos, what's your what's your perspective on this? Yeah, my perspective totally different. I believe in giving time more important. So I, I'm giving my life. My purpose of my life is to save human lives and I'm doing PhD in specializes in emergency management. I've been to Haiti and other places. Mm -hmm. So I don't give money. Prince mm -hmm personally, but I, I'm giving my whole of life. Wherever dis international disaster is to occur, I go there and, you know, to respond to the disasters. Okay. When, yes? I just wanted to comment on that, because I think giving time helps to change you as well as mm -hmm. to uh, affect the charity. Giving money um, makes me feel good and I feel that it's right, but giving time is uh, more effective, I guess, internally to myself. Okay. So yeah. we can it can be a transformative experience. Have uh, Sarah, have you felt that at, at City Year? Oh, definitely. Um, I mean, just working with the kids, sometimes I feel kind of selfish because as much as I know I'm putting time into them and helping them, they're definitely changing me, um, just inspiring me to, to do more work and also just appreciating the education that I came from and the upbringing that I had. We see a lot of, we hear a lot of concern. We just had an election with with some interesting results and some anti-tax, anti-government sentiment. Um, out of that, there, there's often the argument that nonprofits should be performing these function that, that these functions that government often performs. Do you all agree with that, Carlos? I think it should be both. Yeah, I agree. And I look upon the taxes I pay that part of that will be utilized for the welfare, the common good, of the nation. And which I cannot personally just get out there and do, but I expect some of my taxes to be utilized in government agencies that do help for the common good. And then I like to participate personally in the local giving agencies with whom I'm associated. This year and last year, uh, we were not able to add any extra giving because our COLA payments mm -hmm. did not appear in our Social Security income. Sure. So that, that has cut back a little bit on what I had hoped to contribute. Because if the COLA had come in, we planned to give all of it in charitable giving. It did not reach us, so that has reduced some of our possibilities. Chris, you were shaking your head. What, what do you see as the role of nonprofits versus government? What can government do to maybe help nonprofits well, do I their mean, job? I, I agree with Carlos. I think it's both entities that, ha that have to work to provide services for, for people who are in need. Um, however, you know, I certainly understand with budget cuts, it, it's very delicate balance. Um, what I'm personally seeing is because of all the cuts, my mailbox overflows with appeals from nonprofits, and it's very, very difficult. I know, I don't know, you know, I'm sure some of the other people here are doing the same thing. What I find is there's so many worthy organizations that I'm actually giving less to each one just to kind of make, you know, what, what I have go around. But, um, you know, I really feel that it has, there has to be a balance between the governments and the nonprofits, government nonprofit providing services. D Denise, what do you what do you think about the role of nonprofits and 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 government and and the services that nonprofits provide? I agree with what the gentleman back here was saying that um, the government should help where there is a true sincere need, but it is not the job of government mm -hmm. to you know dish out uh, handouts to everybody. Um, you know, there's but. If they are helping nonprofits in a way that the nonprofits are reaching people in need, in true need, I'm all for it. I think that's important. But it's not the job of government to provide for nonprofits. Okay. 
Mary, what about uh, nonprofits in, in terms of what they can do in, in, in helping provide important services? Well, I feel like uh, money is a part of it, but I certainly agree with the other respondents that service to these organizations is extremely important, the human touch. Okay. So just one last question, though. Can government, what about tax incentives, tax deductions to government? Is that, is that valuable to, uh, to you in terms of deciding where to give? Are you more likely to give to an organization that you get a deduction for? Denise? I own a business, and uh, every year we do um, a donation to a particular nonprofit organization. And having that tax write off is, is a great benefit for businesses. And I think that isn't, that's a part that may not have been discussed much. I mean, we're talking about individual giving, and there's two types sure. you know, there's time and there's money. With a business, a lot of times it's it's just money because the time is spent with the employees doing the work to keep the business strong. Sure. But if the businesses are hurting, I mean, I own a, a, a business here in town, and we have really been hit by the economy. Um, so you know, my giving, which also included employees' bonuses and um, you know, health care sure. for my employees, <coughs> that's all had to be cut back too. So. Um, you know, it, it trickles yeah. down at a sure. lot of different levels. Sure. When we return, we'll be joined by a panel of experts to further explore charitable giving and nonprofits in Louisiana. <music> Welcome back to Louisiana Public Square. We're discussing charitable giving and nonprofits in Louisiana. Joining us now is our panel of experts. Derek Gordon has been president of the Arts Council of Greater Baton Rouge since 2006. Mr. Gordon has also served as CEO of Jazz at Lincoln Center and senior vice president of the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. Anne Silverberg Williamson is the president and CEO of the Louisiana Association of Nonprofit Organizations, or LANO. LANO is a statewide network of nonprofits, foundations, corporations, and individuals dedicated to supporting Louisiana's nonprofit sector. Senator Dan Clater is a Republican from Baton Rouge and a practicing attorney. Senator Clater took office in 2009. His committee assignments include positions on revenue and fiscal affairs, judiciary, and interim member of finance. Catherine Martin has been the executive director of the O'Brien House since 1995. O'Brien House was established in 1971 to serve adults, recovering alcoholics, and drug addicts. Her former nonprofit experience includes chairing the Capital Area Alliance for the Homeless. Anne, I thought we'd start with you as former secretary of DSS and now the president and CEO of, of LANO. You've seen both sides of the, uh, of the coin. Talk to us a little bit about what it means for government and nonprofits to work together to serve all these pressing needs that are out there in our community. Sure, Kirby. It's an incredibly dynamic relationship that day in and day out um, certainly is responding to the critical needs of our citizens. The, you know, certainly government as the public sector has a duty um, for service and meeting those most basic needs of our citizenry for our economic stability, our environmental soundness as well as our social fabric and the success of government is very interdependent on the effectiveness of the nonprofit sector. I saw that day in and day out um, from the public side and now with the honor and pleasure of leading and serving on the nonprofit side as well recognize certainly Derek and Catherine will be able to speak to the value that nonprofits offer to our public sector. And Dan, what's that? What do you see as that role as a as a state senator in terms of in terms of the relationship between nonprofits and government? Well, uh, it's an evolving one that is changing as uh, the budget shrinks, and we have to make our choices on what our priorities are there. And it's it's a difficult one. And uh, I was listening to the people talking earlier, and it's encouraging to me to see uh, good folks stepping up and participating in the process. Overall, we, we hear a lot about how difficult it is. We have declining government funding and we have difficulty for nonprofits raising money. Uh, just how bad is it? Uh, and I know you all did a report um, on the fiscal health of nonprofits. Absolutely. Nonprofits in our state are facing um, shortfalls in, ranging anywhere from 12% to 15%. 
Um, the Nonprofit Finance Fund conducted a survey of nonprofits across our nation and recognized that only 18% of nonprofits projected to break even this fiscal year. Um, that's an astounding figure when you consider, again, those most basic needs that nonprofits are responding to in our community at a time when needs are rising. Uh, Derek, is it especially hard for arts organizations to, to raise money in this type of climate? Well, it's particularly hard right now because uh, we've sort of had a perfect storm of uh, challenges to funding for cultural and, and civic activities uh, with reductions at the state and federal level. Uh, more and more organizations that previously perhaps were not going to the same donors are now going to those donors. So there are more people asking uh, individuals for more support and as was mentioned earlier today, uh, I'm sure your mailboxes are overflowing mm -hmm. with requests. Um, to make it a little more difficult, now those requests are requests for social services and human needs, uh, which, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of a, a tough sell to uh, uh, help people understand that the quality of life and community and cultural organizations also really need to be sustained because we lose a lot of ground there when we allow them to uh, fall away. Um, and, uh, you know, the idea that we, can nonprofits do more uh, in so many cases, nonprofit organizations are really closer to the issue. They're from the community. They know the people. They also know how to get more out of the community uh, in terms of donations and, you know, and uh, volunteer work. And so they really are making those dollars go a lot farther in meeting the needs. So uh, I think there's a very clear role for nonprofit organizations and particularly those that make uh, life worth living in our community. Mary, you had a question about nonprofits and accountability. Right. Um, I would like to know where those funds are going. I noticed some of the bigger organizations, you have, they have a pamphlet or a brochure, and they divide it in the circle how much of the pie each person gets. Uh, I'd like to find out about some of these lesser organizations, like not as big as the Red Cross or some of these others, but uh, the ones that you see on street corners with the plastic milk jugs and all, you know, those I question, you know, as to where that money's going. Um, Catherine, you all have been innovative in raising money at the O'Brien House? Well, we certainly have. I'd like to, to address that, that, that it's public record uh, uh, when we file our 990s, and you can look up any reputable um, agency has that. But, but uh, to answer your question, uh, we've been thinking outside of the box continually redefining ourselves as our funds have been uh, uh, cut um, and this year this year um, mm -hmm. uh, we are looking at 1.3 million dollars this time last year we had 1.9 million dollars and it was a cut of the services but what we're doing is we're redefining ourselves and uh, seeing um, how we can serve the community um, in different ways for example we have started with Hiller Moore the DWI diversion program which is a, a, a source of revenue but also a source of support um, in service to the community. We have started a social enterprise which is called Planet Forward which does two things. It, it gives our clients jobs. They earn money um, and uh, this helps them get back on their feet but it also reaches out to the community um, to show them that, um, that people in recovery are working to reclaim their lives and that we're trying to stand on our feet because some of the profits eventually We'll come back to help the parent organization. I'm sorry, on Planet Forward, it sounded like you were talking about the Planet Earth. Can you tell <laughs> us a little bit about the program <laughs> itself? Planet it Forward is a, a lawn uh, maintenance uh, business that we started uh, last February, and it's a seasonal thing. So during the off season, we have uh, also been looking at keeping offices uh, clean and hanging Christmas tree lights and um, doing odd jobs that people need to have done. But come February, we're going to be starting to, to rake out the leaves and cut off the dead limbs and, and do the jobs that, that, um, that need to be done. William, you had talked about um, how important it was that nonprofits be effective and accountable. Would mm -hmm. you state that as a question? Yeah, uh, you had uh, just talked about uh, how all that, uh, um, the effectiveness of each organization, the pie chart, if you will, um, was available. Um, not always as a pie chart, but is available because it's a government part of governmental record. But I do know that there's some websites um, that uh, actually uh, look at that and look at the uh, amount that goes to administration. Uh, I 
can't recall any of the website names. Yeah. If, if GuideStar is one. GuideStar was right. one. Yeah, Charity Navigator yeah. as well. And right here in Louisiana, um, through the Louisiana Association of Nonprofit Organizations, we champion the best practices and policies and principles of the best nonprofits and allow them to have a distinguished certificate of achievement that assures that they are exercising um, the, the furthest extent of accountability in terms of not only financial accountability, governance accountability, and policies and practices. Um, yes, the 990 is an IRS criteria. It is very thorough and comprehensive. It will be lots of numbers. Also, you should know that um, as an interested member of the public, you are always encouraged to ask nonprofits for their most recent annual report. That's another um, way that nonprofits are transparently communicating um, their mission and their purpose as well as their results and their financial accountability. Sorry, go ahead. May I ask a question? Are they not uh, legally required to put on the website the annual uh, reports if they are getting funding from the federal or some state government? There are different criteria relative, and I don't want to speak for the senator, uh, relative to with in doing business with the state government, nonprofits definitely are held to a standard by the legislative auditor's office, and they do have to file annually um, the, the use of their public dollars with the legislative auditor's office. Uh, I, I, uh, I could add to that. Yes. Um, uh, you are required, as Ann mentioned, to, uh, to file your uh, 990 uh, and your tax return and then your, your audit right. with, um, with the legislative auditor. Uh, the requirement is that it be available upon request. Right. Uh, now, more and more organizations are going to uh, putting their annual report mm -hmm. online. And by the way, you can see the annual report for the Arts Council of Greater Baton Rouge. Mm -hmm. We just <laughs> closed out our audit and everything, and right. so it'll be up there for you. Um, but also, uh, it's an important way of letting people know what you're doing. And you say, you know, what about some of these organizations? I think that kind of transparency is really important, you know, because it says these are the things we're doing. This is how we're servicing the community. Uh, this is how we're spending the valuable dollars that you're helping to make available to us. And not every nonprofit um, is created equal in certain ways. The nature of what you do uh, has uh, an impact on what percentage you spend on administrative costs because if it is a labor intensive activity that you're involved in, you're going to see more expenses in labor and programming. Um, one thing that we do is that we make grants on behalf of the state, and hopefully we'll continue to be able to do that, um, <laughs> for, uh, for cultural organizations all across uh, actually an 11 parish area um, for the Arts Council of Greater Baton Rouge. Uh, there's a certain level of accountability that is required whether we make 10 grants or whether we make 1,000 grants, because the state requires that of us. Uh, however, when the grant dollars uh, are reduced, the dollars we can actually give out are reduced, then it increases the cost of delivering that service and unfortunately that's not something we can change. And so, you know, we, we look every year at the percentage of uh, administrative cost to program and, you know, we've, we've been pretty good, but as, as these uh, various uh, forces begin to have an impact on where funding is coming from, inevitably that's going to have an impact on those percentages too. Yeah, and on accountability, uh, as far as William and Mary's uh, question, when there's uh, money that is um, comes from the state of Louisiana, and they talk about the legislative auditor, one of the things that the groups agree to is if our legislative auditor is not satisfied with your numbers, that he can come in there and take a look at your books and Absolutely. go over it. And if there's uh, shenanigans involved, that you potentially exposed to uh, criminal prosecution and that's about as bad as it can get. Uh, so there is some oversight on it. Once upon a time, uh, I've only been at the legislature uh, for the past two sessions, uh, not even two years. Uh, they seem to have given out money to practically any group that would apply and there weren't, wasn't any real oversight on the part of the government. You would hear about groups that you would go, who is this group that just got $250,000? Um, but in, uh, we had a little bit of it in the intro here. They've changed that. There's joint rules and there's an act. And if you care to, you can actually go on the legislative website, uh, go to the financial page, and there's a part about NGOs, and you can review the non-governmental organization's applications. Some groups put in very uh, nice applications with a lot of attachments, a lot of information. Some, uh, there are uh, 
backup paperwork is not all that great, but it may be just a matter of they're not that versed in it and they still provide a very valuable service. And the um, format is an internet format that they fill out as they go along and so they're limited in how they can respond on that. But, uh, the more experienced groups are down at the Capitol quite a bit uh, trying to persuade the various members that their cause has merit. Uh, Crystal, you had a question earlier? I know that Governor General just recently led the way in changing um, the way NGOs qualify for governmental money. So I was wondering, would it be helpful if they would also be evaluated by a third party such as Lander before the, they get the government money instead of just being evaluated by a certain set of legislative standards? Well, uh, it, you're correct in that he led the way along with Representative Schroeder on the uh, legislation that was brought. There's uh, particular cutoffs, and it's not just reviewed by the legislature, it's also re reviewed by the governor's office. And one of the things that you'll see in the budget, you'll see veto message, and you click on the veto message, and the governor's office says it didn't fit the requirements of an NGO, didn't serve the purpose, wasn't regional or whatever. And so it's not just the legislative eyes on it, it's also the uh, governor's eyes on it as well. It seems like it'd be more neutral and more uh, have, have an influence from the citizens of somebody like Lano and not just uh, the people directly um, dealing with the legislation and the governor's <coughs> office were making that decision. Well, things could always be better, but that, that's the system that we have <laughs> now. And uh, there are a lot of folks that are of the opinion that we shouldn't be in that business at all. That's the debate that we see in Congress right now, no earmarks, we shouldn't be doing that type of thing. And with the shrinking budget, uh, it may be an issue that we don't even address anymore and that it may evaporate and go away. I don't see that happening anytime soon, but we have a billion and a half dollar shortfall. Brad was waiting to get in a question as well. You I'm just sorry. actually touched on what my question was. My question was, what is the need for legislative appropriation of money for NGOs when there is a grant writing process? And how do those two processes work together? How do they differ? What, what, what is the need for the <coughs> legislative appropriation side of it? Okay. Well, I can't speak for the uh, NGOs and the various groups that are making applications. They look at the uh, array of different groups that they can apply to, but uh, ultimately the House of Representatives, not the Senate, uh, are the ones that write in the bills and decide uh, where the money is distributed, and we just say yay or nay to it for the most part. But that's just one avenue. They have other avenues, and that's the one that we have now. If you go to the legislative website and look at the NGO requirements, you can see what's uh, there, but as Crystal was pointing out, uh, perhaps it could be done better, but that's the system that we have at this point. Uh, I think it goes back to our history of legislators liking to dole out the money. I mean, that's the long and the short of it. And I'd like to uh, make a clarifying uh, comment to that because um, those NGO um, grants are not the only way that the government works with the nonprofit sector. Um, in particular, O'Brien House and some of the mental health associations um, have contract, uh, contracts with the, the, uh, the state to provide services, and we get fees for services. Um, through um, Access to Recovery, which is a voucher system where um, a, a, a person gets a certain amount of money, uh, $2,500 on a voucher to be used within uh, six months, and we provide the services and we uh, invoice for the services that we're, that we're supplying. And that kind of a relationship is, is a very good one because it, we are very accountable for the specific services. And um, un unfortunately, um, the healthcare um, uh, system is uh, one of the first to receive cuts. So um, that's uh, causing us to be much more creative in providing the services. And, and so, Brad, that comes out of a different portion of the budget. Right. And, and uh, we're locally having a debate about prisons and sale of prisons and whatnot. Uh, our budget uses more than a half a billion dollars for prisons and so a program like the O'Brien House that helps people stay out of prison and we address it on the front end is a, a leveraging of our dollars in a sense and that uh, right. we could hardly spend our dollars any better on keeping people out of prison when we we lock up people in Louisiana more than anybody in the free world in the non-free world mm -hmm. so uh, that's, uh, that's a great service mm -hmm. that they do How not to say that arts aren't great <laughs> <too>. <laughs> Uh, I, if, if I could just add a comment uh, to your question, Brad, uh, programs like uh, the 
uh, diversified art funding that we do across the state uh, and state arts grants, that there is a process. It's a very specific process. Uh, there are reviewers who are in place to make those decisions. Uh, and so you can pretty much rest assured that learned individuals who know the field have looked at these grants and have capability of the organizations to deliver. Um, however, uh, we do live in a political environment and um, I'm not quite sure what they call it in Louisiana, but I know when I was working in Pennsylvania, they called it walking around money. And those were dollars that individual legislators requested for specific programs in their communities. Now, on the other hand, if I'm a legislator, I'm certainly going to be concerned about my community. And if there's an opportunity to do something uh, that's going to be good in the community, I'm certainly going to make that request. I'm going to ask for that earmark. Um, but they uh, operate in a very different manner. And I think um, last year there were a, a large number of uh, non-governmental earmarks that were vetoed uh, by the governor. Um, I, th I think the challenge is, you know, how truly do you make those decisions or do you simply say no more earmarks, which is the discussion that's going on in Congress right now. Right, and I expect that we'll be having right. in the legislature as well. And it's a, they're difficult choices when you have all these different things that are occurring out there. Right. If I had my preference, we wouldn't have anything to do with it. But uh, that's the landscape that we operate mm -hmm. in. And that in no way, though, is the sole definer of the relationship between state government and the nonprofit community. And I think I'm so glad we've had this full discussion because, the, the, again, the interrelatedness between state government and nonprofits is very deep and vast and thorough, and it's transparent and competitive with defined criteria when there are those funding relationships that occur directly through the State Department. When we have so many nonprofits out in the community and everybody's talking about getting the multiple appeals and the multiple fundraising requests, how important is, is it to get a coordinated effort and coordinate the activity of nonprofits to make sure that, that people feel like they're giving to the right organization or the right cause or the right group? Well, I, I think it's terribly important. and. Uh, Fortunately or unfortunately, the responsibility ultimately lies with you as yes. the giver. Yes. Uh, and so I really encourage uh, all of you and any of our viewers uh, to really look into the organizations that are asking for your support. Um, I know that Lano and also the Arts Council and, and working with some uh, grant makers here in the Greater Baton Rouge area are constantly struggling with the uh, multiplicity of organizations that are doing essentially the same service. And is there a way that they could be more efficient, more effective, uh, if they work together rather than staying separate? Now, unfortunately, uh, in some cases, the motivation for starting a nonprofit organization is a very personal mission. And in that sense, people are doing it because it's their passion, and they've done it that way, and they want to do it that way. But I think more and more uh, grant makers are beginning to ask very hard questions about that efficiency and to try and encourage people to find ways to collaborate, make those dollars go farther, reduce the administrative costs, get more services out to individuals. Well, I think that's what we're talking about because I grew up, I have a 60 acre farm in North Carolina. I grew up working hard. We had corn, cotton, tobacco, everything, but we all got out there and helped one another. We had tobacco tines, corn shuckings, whatever it took because we knew if one farmer failed, it could be us next. Mm -hmm. So we all collaborated and helped one another. Uh, and what are some examples of how nonprofits are collaborating across the state? To Outstanding. Uh, it, it is absolutely um, the direction that not, that not only um, do we encourage donors to consider, but we as nonprofits ourselves recognize that what we can achieve in partnership is going to magnify the impact on our communities than what we can do individually and alone. And so um, there was a great feature already in the show um, tonight or today around um, the work between the ARC and Hope Ministries. That's one example of it, the most important element to success in collaborations is that nonprofit organizations remain true to their core mission that we do not force partnerships for the sake of the partnership and um, essentially promote it on paper but not in practice. And so across the state of Louisiana in the nonprofit sector, we really have seen the value. It starts with conversation and it starts with knowing one another and understanding one another and seeing that again, through your core principles and practices, there are certainly opportunities. The most frequently um, witnessed and experienced forms of partnership and collaboration are definitely through 
the back office um, administrative services, whether it be financial services or um, you know, office keeping human resources. But again, as Derek says, individuals come to nonprofits with passion. Individuals come to nonprofits with a vision for making Louisiana's life better. And um, to the extent that there are experts with skills that can then um, add value to that mission work, that's where nonprofits can really um, achieve great collaborative gains. Denise, you had a question. And maybe you could answer it, or our legislator can answer it. Um, if Bobby Jindal has vetoed all of this millions of dollars of slush funds that the, now the that the uh, the nonprofits are not getting, is any of that reallocated to the nonprofit organizations that have been approved by the state? No, ma'am. There's, there's. I'm sorry. Were you going to? No, go right ahead. Uh, uh, there's a process, and they make an application for a particular amount, and if it's vetoed, it uh, doesn't get reallocated, it, except in the sense, like locally, one of the things we saw happen recently was Nucor. So perhaps you could say it got reallocated to Nucor or reallocated to higher ed or healthcare, but it doesn't just go on to another um, nonprofit. I, I think in, in many of those cases, it's also about balancing the state budget. And so by, you know, cutting out uh, a number of those uh, NGO requests, uh, it's also an effort to bring the budget, uh, you know, sort of back into, into control. Um, the support, for example, for the arts uh, is a per capita allocation that the state has been giving. And that per capita allocation uh, is for every parish in the state. As I mentioned, we serve an 11 parish area and the funds dedicated to that parish have to be spent within that parish. And so there's a very structured review process to ensure that knowledgeable individuals are looking at the requests coming from that parish uh, so that the funds are going to be put to good use. But um, we never see an increase in those funds when NGOs are cut. So, yeah. Following up behind the, uh, uh, when you talk about general and, and the cutting, uh, he had three, 358 that he he cut out of 370. So therefore, 12 went through. Well, what what happens? What's the repercussions for the services and the, that would be provided by the funds that have been cut from those programs? I mean, I'm, 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 I'm a common man. I'm looking at, well, if that's not there, then what, what's going to happen? Who, who's going to pick up the ball and continue with the services that's necessary because the life still goes on? I guess that's for me, right, Ron? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 my response to that is, is I think a little bit, uh, the numbers may be a little bit wrong on the uh, amount of cutting. A lot of cutting happened, but I don't believe it was to the degree that you're talking about. But who picks it up is you and me individually. Uh, we're, uh, my family, we participate heavily with uh, St. Vincent de Paul. We think that's a good program. And so it's each one of us uh, individually that's picking up the slack. I agree with you wholeheartedly. So what I'm saying, what, what I'm looking at is that as, as a common man, you, you represent, you're my representative, you, you all have in all this business. Well, what happened? Who, 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 who slipped? Uh, why wasn't it uh, dissected properly where it wouldn't, those wouldn't be cut? Why hadn't the, 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 the numbers come out right? You, you see what I'm saying? Uh, well, I, I hear what you're saying, but the problem is, is when we look in our purse, it's not even half full. I, it's it's yeah, low, after and so those, after all those cuttings, the the budget still is short. Yes, sir, Ronnie. And and how we got to that point is, um, you got to think back before Katrina, and then we had Katrina come, and we had this huge amount of money come into the state of Louisiana. I wasn't in the capital at that time, but everybody, it's like the holidays came on, everybody got fat, and it was Thanksgiving and Christmas. And then uh, after Katrina, we had uh, other issues like the stimulus money came in. And so rather than maintaining that diet that we do the rest of the year, we got bloated and we spent the money like drunken sailors, really, uh, on some of these things. And now we're being asked to go back to where we were before. So it is a false prosperity that we had for a period of time. But that doesn't mean that the legislator or the governor doesn't care. Everybody was heartbroken over 
these things that are happening as far as cuts in health care, cuts in education, and cuts in NGOs. Uh, I'm a fan of the arts. We go to the symphony. My wife paints. Uh, we like to see those things, but when you're limited on what you have, you just, it's like Christmas. I tell my clients sometimes when we're trying to work out a resolution, I said, I wanted a pony for Christmas, but I didn't get one. You know, I mean, it just, we can't, we got to live within our means on these. And, and I don't mean to sound harsh on that, but it's just, we're limited on what we have. We're coming up a billion and a half short. Um, these legislative appropriations, I think it's also called pork barrel spending. Is that, th this is money that's, after all the necessities are paid for, if we have a surplus left over, then we can go ahead and spend the money on, allocate the money towards it. Is that correct? This isn't money that was pre-approved, already in a budget somewhere, set aside to spend on an NGO or a nonprofit. It's money that's after the fact, after all costs, any surplus could go to something like that. Is that correct? That may be correct for Congress. I, I'm a newbie uh, in our state Senate. and. Um, it doesn't really work the way that you've described it in the states and it might work that way federally but uh, it's a it's an issue that comes about I don't know if you saw this in the paper a while back but uh, I was lamenting that LSU was taking a hit on some of this stuff and we were talking about why should NGOs be going on when we need to concentrate on health care and higher education and one of the legislators from the northern part of the state said I don't have any LSU where I come from. And it's important for me to take care of our folks with the Council on the Aging and the Arts and the other things in his district where he was talking about that earlier. I don't know that I agree with that, uh, but that's the system that's there and they got folks that are working to change that. But uh, in the end, y you can't deny that a lot of good is done through these organizations. and so balancing them and making choices. And, and at the same time though, if I, if I might offer though, that the challenge that we're already hearing is that these are in one sense false choices because this is about a state um, with vast needs and um, tremendous responsibility to our citizens and a close um, evaluative look at both our revenues as well as our expenditures are part of a full dialogue and a full conversation. And this is a great forum for it, and yeah, I'm glad we're that. having it. Yeah, Unfortunately, we've run out of time for our discussion. We want to thank our <laughs> panelists, Mr. Gordon, Ms. Williamson, Senator Clater, and Ms. Martin. When we come back, we'll have a few closing comments. What a thoughtful uh, conversation we had. You know, these are difficult topics. Yeah, great questions, a lot of interest in nonprofits, a lot of support for nonprofits, and a lot of hope for government to help them in serving people. Well, I think that personally, everyone should be thinking about what their top uh, charities would be during this season because I think Money Magazine had a great article on it. Senator Clater was talking about it earlier, and uh, uh, maybe there's some good guidelines and, and how to decide what to give. And hopefully, we'll all think about that a little more at this time of year. It's the season of giving, so hopefully we give well. Absolutely. Well, that's all the time we have for this edition of Louisiana Public Square. We encourage you to visit our website at lpb.org slash public square. While, while you're there, you can take this month's survey. Check out links on tax tips for charitable giving and volunteer to be in our audience, like Brad French did, who joined us tonight. We'd also love to get your feedback on tonight's show. Post a comment like Val did following last month's program, Combating Crime in Louisiana. Val suggests preventing crime through education, early intervention, and economic development. If only people could be motivated to learn and have their kids learn and succeed. Well, thanks for the input, Val. LPB will continue to do its part in providing quality educational programming for children of all ages. University students have voiced their frustration, and numerous new groups have been formed to combat cuts to higher education. But the state's $1.6 billion shortfall could mean chopping 32% more under a worst case scenario. Can the state's university and college systems withstand more budget cuts? Join us for Saving Higher Education next month on Louisiana Public Square. Thanks for watching and good night. Good night everyone and have a happy holiday.
For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or go online to www.lpb.org. Support for this program is provided by the men and women of the Louisiana Forestry Association. Through sustainable forestry, LFA members promote the health and productivity of Louisiana's forests for generations to come. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting.